Thank you all for coming on this lovely afternoon, early evening. Um, I'm John Tilford. I think all of you, most of you know me. I'm the curator of collections here at Oglethorpe University Museum of Art. And about four years ago, our wonderful Barb Henry of the Office of University Advancement re-established a relationship with Carl David, who graduated from Oglethorpe in 1970. And he has not been back since, but we're very happy he's back now. And um, ever since Barb reached out to Carl, Elizabeth also began to speak with him, and then I entered the conversation about a year ago, and we were thinking of ways to work together with his gallery and with the university, and the result is this wonderful exhibition of the American Surrealist Leon Kelly. But just to give you a little bit of background on Carl David, as I said, he graduated from Oberthorpe in 1970. He is the third generation proprietor of the David David Gallery of Philadelphia, which was founded more than a century ago by his grandfather in 1910. And I believe the firm began in New York and then moved eventually to Philadelphia. And they are one of the most uh, venerable galleries in America. They uh, include, their clients include nearly every great American museum that one can think of. And we are thrilled and honored that Carl uh, made this exhibition possible. This is the first venue of a touring exhibition. And many of these works were acquired by the David David Gallery from the estate of the artist. So we're going to learn a great deal more about Leon Kelly this evening. Thank you. Thank you, everybody. Thank you for coming out. Um, I appreciate that. I'm honored to be here. And as John had mentioned, this is the first time we've been back since 1970. Um, I stopped counting, but it won't be the last time I'm here. Uh, this was just a mind-blowing visit that was really emotional and rewarding to see what is still going on here at the college, the advancements, and yet the integrity. And some of you we see each other last night, but so if I repeat myself, forgive me, but it's worth mentioning that the integrity of, of the buildings and the school system itself and everything is just it's, it's incredible. So the fact that there's still a population of about 1,300 is also kind of mind-blowing to me. It's nice that it's that small, but it'd be great if it expands incrementally. I don't know if the facility can handle it, maybe build more, who knows. Uh, but anyhow, so I've been in this business since I left here in 1970. I went home and I asked my dad if I could fall into the family business. And he said, sure, he said, but it's not going to be a cakewalk just because the last name is David. And I said, fine, I get it, I understand. I said, what do we need to do? Well, I was getting coffee, and I was running to get the meters, and learning how to package things, and doing all the things that an art dealer needs to do, because one day, the guy who's working for you who does that is not going to show up, or they're just times that you just have to do this on your own. So the basic mechanics of the industry were a learning experience. So I went home, my dad died three years later. Um, my brother was in the business with us at the same time, and. When my dad passed away, he said, I'm only going to stay for nine months. I'm burnt out. I can't do this anymore. He came out of Wharton, became a stockbroker, and I came into the business back in the early 60s. And I said, okay. So I got into a bit of a panic. Um, I had just been married six months and decided this. I really have to buckle down. And I used all the tools I learned at Oglethorpe, um, as well as what my dad had taught me and my brother had taught me, business, ethics, morals, everything else that, that a business needs to run properly. And I came out in a year, I was, I was running the business, I was, as I said last time, I was like Michael Corleone and the Godfather. Um, I had no choice but to come out and to, to run the thing by the, take it by the handles and just run with it. So we specialize in American and European 17th through 21st century paintings, drawings, watercolors, occasional sculpture, and we never know what we're going to find, but we have a a pursuit of excellence, which we've always had for quality. So if it's something that doesn't look right, doesn't feel right, doesn't smell right, we stay away from it. I don't care how much money is involved in it. Um, it's just, we don't do that. Uh, maybe one of the few galleries in the world, or in the country, that could, I can put my head down at night and say, you know what, we did the right thing. Um, I, four years ago, was asked to go through the FBI Citizens Academy, and I, said to my friend who asked me about it, I said, what is that? I didn't even know they had a Citizens Academy. So I said, it's an eight-week program. You'll go to all the intelligence centers. You'll learn all about what the FBI does. And then you become the eyes and ears for the community, for the FBI. 
So I'm thinking, okay, this is great. I don't know, other than stolen paintings, I'm not sure how this will play out, but happy to do it. And it was an eye-opening experience. It was incredible. We went, we did blood spatter work. We went to the intelligence centers. We went to headquarters. We went to um, Quantico. We did shooting. We did everything that's involved and got the whole picture of what these guys really do. These men and women at the Bureau put themselves out there on the front lines. They, don't, they run into trouble. They don't run away from it. It's amazing. So when we graduated, um, I was thinking, how can I be useful you know, to this arm of uh, you know, the, the, uh, it's just the legal the law enforcement. You know, how, how can I be useful? So they came to me and they said, look, they said, you know, we need you to keep your eyes open for things like money laundering. I said, how so? I said, well, there are large sums of cash that get filtered into the art market it's actually coming from drug money or terrorist funding, and it gets flipped back, it gets cleaned, it goes back to fund terrorism. So it's like, wow, that's unbelievable. So we're always on the lookout for something like that. I mean, cash business in this business almost doesn't exist anymore, but you never know. You know, somebody could come in with a suitcase full of cash and uh, want you to clean it for them. So we always look for that kind of thing because it's, it's scary, but it's something we do. I gave a talk to a bunch of retired FBI agents and active agents, they asked me to give a talk about art crime, and you know, art crime is not just money laundering and theft, but you have forgeries and vandalism, all these things that, that occur in different areas of the world. Somebody uh, recently knocked the knee off of David. Uh, I took a hammer, and, you know, I just, how did somebody do that? Somebody threw glue on Mona Lisa, you know, hot fluids and stuff. Fortunately, the, the, the plexi was in front of it, but it's crazy. So we don't have to worry about this here. I mean, that's it. So Leon Kelly is not getting vandalized. Might be copied, might be faked at some point, but it won't be vandalized. So my son, my wife, and my, both our sons and my wife are in the business. We're, my son's the fourth generation. My wife and I work together. We have another gallery in Palm Beach called Provident Fine Art that we partnered with another concern. Uh, small gallery, but still it's active. And we've got Leon Kelly down there as well. So a while ago, my son and I were looking at the Leon Kellys. We offered them in, in a consignment position, and we were selling them. And we looked and said, you know, I wonder what the rest of the estate looks like. We should really have a look at this. So we approached the family through someone we knew, and there were hundreds of these pictures. It's like, wow, you know, can we buy them? So long story made short, we bought all of them. I mean, it was a humongous effort with a really deep financial commitment. But we saw the potential. We knew how incredible he was. Leon came out of the Pennsylvania Academy in the 1920s, in the Pennsylvania Academy in Philadelphia. Big, major art organization that's that spawned so many great painters. We Merritt Chase, Thomas Aikens, and the list goes on and on. So Leon Kelly was a student of Arthur B. Carl's in the 20s. And his work sometimes looks like Arthur B. Carl's, other times it looks like any number of people that he was working with. But he left the Academy. And in the 1930s, he was with Julian Levy Gallery in New York, and in the 40s. So he was in a stable with Salvador Dali, Joseph Cornell, Mara, Yves Tanguy, all the big names of the, that were doing this modernism and surrealism. So he was right in the same, in the fold with all the rest of these guys that were being sponsored and pushed by Levy. Well, that was great for Leon Kelly, but he wasn't satisfied with that. He really had a different angle. He went from academic. So if you look at some of these pictures, like this still life, I'm going to go around and point to some of these just to give you a sense of what the, the style is. This still life of fruit and the other one over there, these are from the 1920s when he was actually working at the Pennsylvania Academy. Early, academic, and yet some of them are like Cezanne. I mean, you, you, you can feel Cezanne in this because he went to Europe and he spent a lot of time at the Louvre and a lot of time emulating the old masters and copying them. He was caught between two worlds in Paris. He went to the Louvre because he loved the traditional old masters. And then he also loved the modernist movement with the impressions like Monet and, and Picasso and uh, yeah, all the rest of this Renoir. So when he got a little, this is still a 20s landscape that's kind of impressionistic. This one looks very much like a Cezanne. It looks like a Cezanne bathers thing. And if you didn't know that it was signed Cezanne, you could believe it. He was that much influenced by the French impressionist and post impressionist. And yet, he still retained his own style. That's the life over here is another early example. But it's got motion to it, it's alive, and it's got great color and form. So it's not just like some 
still life that stayed. I mean, it really has movement to it, and it's, it's got great energy in it. The painting next to it is Henriette, who is one of his wives. And I say one of because he was married to her. They later got divorced. He met her in, in uh, France, and she wound up going back to France, and he married Earl Horder's ex-wife. Earl Horder was another contemporary artist, and these guys were all kind of hung out together. So it's like life then, life now, it's kind of the same. It's when there's divorce, it's when marriage. This one, and it's, you know, it's just a, it's life. So that was a portrait of her. Uh, done in the 20s again, and later on in life, he became more impressionistic. So he went from this academic style, and he got to, if you look at these, these two, sorry, I'll make you all turn around, but uh, those two landscapes over there from the 20s and 30s, and the one on the right was done in France, and it looks like it could be a Monet, or it could be a Pissarro, or a Sicily, because it's got that same vibrance to it, and the same post-impressionist feel. Um, I don't want to drag you all around the room, but we'll, 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 we'll. We can get up. We're not in the room. Okay, sure. Yeah. All, let's, let's have a tour. But before we go, I want to show you this one. This one was done in, in Valencia, in Spain. And it's a wonderful, it almost has a French feel to that, but it's a wonderful village scene, and yet he has the feature of a floating woman above it. And there's a little thread of smoke coming from the chimney, which is basically symbolizing what he felt was terrestrial and extraterrestrial and spiritual. The guy was an amazing spirit, and he had, he had a very strong interest in, in nature. He grew up um, not of any means, and his father, who was a tailor, he was in the, in the clothing industry, his business went south and he went bankrupt when ready-made clothes came into vogue. So he had a farm that he had bought when he was doing as well. So he used to take Leon to the farm on weekends, and Leon had this great appreciation of nature. Animals, the clouds, the grass, the landscape, everything. So later in life, he went in the 1940s to love ladies in New Jersey, and he married his second wife, Helen. And that lasted for a while. He had a great dog named Rusty, and they used to walk up and down the beach. But he had, if, if you look at the pictures on the back wall, um, that look like insects. There's one on the, up to the right of the piano. Um, he had this vision where he would see these giant mosquitoes when he was in Love Ladies in New Jersey. And these animals that he recreated in his mind, he made them larger than life. And he made people wonder, is this real or is this somebody's imagination? So the aspect of animals in his paintings, like monkeys, horses, insects, birds, um, all derived from his nature, hold on, and love of nature. His, um, some of these become, later in life he became surreal. He was a surrealist. I mean, he went from Impressionism, academia, to Impressionism, to Post-Impressionism, to Modernism. He did Social Realism. He was kind of all across the board. And he wound up being, in his, in his later years, um, the this, this surrealist. And he's known as the American Surrealist because that's really his extraordinary talent. I mean, he is, he's right up there with Dali. He may not be as expensive yet. <laughs> uh, he may be when we're finished with him. <laughs> but he was just as talented and just as skilled. And if you, you see the other end of the exhibition of the Dali things on the other side, they pair so well. I didn't have a chance until today to really take a look at them. And they're just, it's so, it's a great symbiotic relationship, the, the two of them. Um, we can, if you want to walk back here, yeah. and let's let's have a look, so I can really try to give you a hands-on explanation of the different periods of this work. These things over here, this, these become a little more abstract. This is called El Capitan, and it's you can have to make your own interpretation of it, but it's his interpretation. Excuse me, interpretation of what he saw, and it's the captain. Whether it's a captain on a boat, or it's his, it's just, it's his concept. So it's a little abstract, but it's, it's a beautiful composition, it works well, it flows together. And this one is really cool. This is, <laughs> I'm in the way here, I'm sorry, it's a man with a plant. And here's the figure of the man, and the plants are next to him. But these are the things that he saw, that he felt, from his perception of what the human spirit was in conjunction with nature, and how they work together, and how they, they, through a blurred lens, in a way, if you will, 
how he created this image because it looks like it, it could be an ant, um, some kind of insect, but it's a man. So man's relationship with nature and, and all the other creatures that are, that are on the planet, he felt very close to. The next one is called uh, Ancient Priest Examining Himself. And it's an introspective piece. This is what he saw blending a bit of religion and spirit with reality. I mean, it looks like it could be someone in a palette, an artist, almost if it's a self-portrait, it's not, but it, it could be interpreted as such. But it's real linear and flat. And he, he went to Larry, Wyoming, at one point in his life, and he spent a couple of years there, and he was studying these, these uh, Peruvian textiles, which were very flat, and they had no shadows. And this is an example of something that was influenced by that. He had, there's no shadows in this, it's just, it's almost one dimensional. It's, What's it on, what kind of? It's on canvas, I think. Let me touch it, I can do that. <laughs> yep, it's on canvas. Uh, he used canvas, he used board, um, he used wooden panels, whatever he felt was appropriate Are these for the your subject. frames, or is that how you read uh, them? Most of these came this way from the estate. Okay. We have had some framed, um, and some frames changed. I mean, he couldn't afford to frame them all, so mm -hmm. sometimes the family would frame them, or if he put something on it didn't look right, <clears throat> excuse me, we would change it because we keep the original frame, but we would change it to make it look like what it was really supposed to look like. Mm -hmm. Because a lot of artists can't afford to put the appropriate frames on to make something really explode. So... Over here, <clears throat> these are much more surrealistic. And you can see the figures. You can see hands and feet and figures floating in the air. Uh, this is called the Levitation of Sylvia. And it's just a lifting of spirit of a human being into another realm, another dimension. I know this may all sound crazy, but this is, this is who he was. And this is what he saw. And this was his message and his interpretation. So when you can feel something like that by an artist, if you understand what they were trying to portray, you have any sense of the feeling of it, that's what makes great work. I mean, if you can, you can feel the translation of, of his work, his spirit, his intent, and, and what he was seeing. This is another one. This is a, I'm going to go on the other side of this, sorry. Uh, this is a really cool picture. This is called um, Untitled Composition, okay? But it's... <laughs> Very inventive, creative title. <laughs> but this is a work that, again, is surreal, and it's a blending of what would look like some kind of metaphysical being, um, an interstellar, extraterrestrial being that, you know, he's, he's got his colors, but this is surrealism. And you can, see, you can see a figure. This looks like an eye over here with a head reclining, and this could be another figure or part of the same body. But it's a, And the, the range of color, the guy was incredible with color. He was not bashful. He really, and he wasn't afraid, he didn't care what society told him to do or not to do. He, he really had his own style. Thank God, because that's great. That's what I think makes a really individual artist who they are. And the colors in this thing are just, they're explosive. They pop these little bits of shadow in here. Um, and this one does have shadow, not like that one, it's flat. This is really three dimensional. So these things were done in the 60s, which in the, in the late 50s, 60s, and 70s, he really hit his mark. I love the earlier things, but when you watch the evolution of his style, from where he came to where he wound up, this is genius. Um, you don't have to love it, but for what it is, it's genius. And it, you know, a lot of artists you got a love-hate relationship with because some people say, "Oh, I hate that. I couldn't live with that." That's fine. You know, it, art is subjective. It's supposed to be that way. You're supposed to have a passion for something you love and a dislike for something that you don't like and wouldn't live with it. Because I have clients who would never even give this a second look. You know, they're, they're much more steeped in classical and traditional, and that's great. But there are other clients who love this, and they get it, they understand it. It's, it you know, it's, it's like vanilla and chocolate, something for everybody, all different flavors. Um, this is another one he did when he was in Mallorca in 1960 to 62. And this is called Maya with a Mallorcan fan. And there's so much going on in this picture. You've got the juxtaposition of the figure with the sky and the landscape and... You, there are body parts all over the place, and, and just she's just floating in a spiritual realm, um, which is what he felt at that time frame. And, and this is, a, I think, this is an incredible picture. I really do. Uh, personal opinion, but it just, it's, I think, it speaks for itself. This is another one, um, Cuban Signal, and I'm actually not sure of exactly what the interpretation is, but 
There's a body here, a figure, and there's a finger pointing upward into what I think are the clouds. And it's the colors are amazing in this picture. And it's somebody almost like reaching out up to the outer universe, whether it's for help or it's just as a signal. Um, the Cuban part, I'm not sure. I mean, it's just that's something I haven't been able to find out just yet. But it's, it's a, a very powerful work. And it just it doesn't stop. And these are all like 60s, 70s pictures. Yeah, I feel like I'm talking about a Chevrolet. It's a 1960s <laughs> Chevrolet here. <laughs> Still going. Um, then the next one is called Cascade of Souls. And that is another spiritual work that he did where you got, he felt the cascading of different souls that they're floating in, in, in the universe and they're coming together between human and extraterrestrial. And you can see these figures, again, they look sort of like insects and animal aberrations, but they're, there's still a human element to it. And the colors are amazing. They're just like, they're extraordinary. The, the, the oranges and the reds and the contrast, and it's very three-dimensional. I mean, you can see the different levels in this, in this work, where some of the figures are floating and some of them are just kind of intertwined with the, the background, uh, the juxtaposition of some of the forms and the color, and if none of this makes sense to you, it's okay, you know, but, but it is what it is. And he was a, a veritable genius. He really was. This looks like they're holding this figure up and just lifting up, pardon me, to get out of the way here. Um, if anybody has any questions about any of these as we're going along, please feel free to, you know, this is a... Uh, did, uh, did he have personal contact with Doug? He did. He did. That was related to my question, which is he was remarkable transition. What influenced him? Uh, it was his own evolution. He would see things by different artists like Dali and Joseph Cornell and Magritte and all these other people, but he, he, he took his own path. It's just however he evolved, he did this on his own. This is what he felt he needed to do. He probably had the answer to it. Oh yeah, this was definitely something he knew exactly what he was doing, um, and and whatever he decided, however abstract in the composition. I mean, this is surreal, but it's, it's, there's an abstract quality about it in in its interpretation and trying to envision what he saw, what he was feeling. To me, it looks like there's a couple figures and they're propped up, and one is holding the other up, and yet they're floating. And I just beyond that, I'm not really sure, but it's just. It works well. It's a beautifully orchestrated work. Mm -hmm. Now the self-portrait over here, um, which is not for sale, is, this is right out of. I'm sorry. Let me get him inside. This is right out of Cezanne okay. and Manet mm -hmm. and Matisse. This is something if you saw and in, in, signed any one of those, you would swear it was him. Um, this was done in 19. Was it 20, mm -hmm. 29. 29, 27. Yeah, I can't remember yeah. what I did. 29. Okay. So this was at a point where the depression had just hit, and he was struggling. I mean, you know, he had had one-man shows at different galleries um, at Levy, and then all of a sudden everything kind of turned south, and in the 40s it picked up again. But he, he had a tough time. He struggled, uh, struggled financially, and, you know, the, the father's business had fallen apart early on, and... It's, it's, it was tough for an artist then. It was still, it's, as it is today, it's difficult. Um, unless you're somebody like, um, you know, if you were Picasso, you know, that was different. But this is, I just think it's an absolutely stunning portrait. Um, I don't know if we'll ever sell it. You know, if every, everything in the estate is sold at some point, maybe, but maybe not. You know, it's just, uh, if anybody's interested, I'm sorry, we can't sell it. <laughs> Uh, let's see what we have right here on the other wall. I mean, let me scoot over here and get out of the right way. Okay, so we have these two paintings uh, of that same Palenza period, and um, they're later. They're surrealistic portraits. Who they are exactly, who he knew, um, and he would paint people that he had close relationships to. We had portraits of his daughter Paula. Um, we had one actually looked like that. that the same, sometimes real small but tight and, and wonderful. Well, this is another early one. Well, this picture is really cool. This is his his apartment in Paris, 1927. When he left, he left in, in about 25 or 26, went to Paris, 
the 27, this is where he stayed. And it has the address on it and, and everything. And since this, is a, this is a real piece of connecting with him because this is where he was. Mm -hmm. And it, it's just, it's just a really cool picture. So, and if you ask about price ranges, just as a for instance, they start at about 6,500 and they go up to a quarter million dollars at the moment. Some of those will be higher because the, the more we sell, the fewer we have. And some of the really, really major works that are gigantic are back in Philadelphia. Um, and they're, they're absolutely stunning. So we're bringing these out enough to make a market and bring them back with recognition. But some of the bigger, heavier things we're going to save for later because they're, they're going to be the, the end of the run, basically. And, and we're going to want them for other museum shows. So uh, this will be the first major museum show. Thank you, John. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Elizabeth. And thank you, Barb. Where are you? You're back there. Okay. Uh, I mean, this has just been a, it's been a great opportunity to showcase Leon Kelly for the greatness that, that he is. And he really was a genius. I mean, you know, whether you like his work, you don't like his work. You have to appreciate his development and, and against all odds what he did and where he wound up. And he's in museum collections all over the country and all over Europe. Um, he had he's in the Philadelphia Museum collection. He's in the museum in Newark. He's in the museum in uh, MoMA. He's in the museum of modern art in New York. And and there's one in the Met that own, they own a, a major work of his as well. So he's really well healed. So guys, we're in good company here. You know, <laughs> the Oglethorpe University Museum of Art is the new standard as far as I'm concerned. I mean, this is this is his breakaway moment where. We bring them back, and we can say that it all started here because it really did. So I don't know if anybody has any questions about Leon or anything else about me or business or what we do or yes, sir. How did you piece together this biography that you uh... um, took a lot of work? Um, a lot of a lot of <coughs> he's listed, and there are articles about him everywhere. Um, there have been other shows in other galleries years ago of his work. So some of that legwork was done and made it a little easier. But we just, I, I recently wrote an article for the Antiques and Fine Art Magazine on Leon Kelly, the American Surrealist. They asked me to write an article. And it was concurrent with the Palm Beach show and with this. And um, it's, it's, I have to say it's a really good article. I'm a good writer. Uh, <laughs> and I also have to say that's partially the fault of Oglethorpe. Uh, Oglethorpe got me started on my writing career. I wrote an article years ago for the, for the school, uh, the paper, Stormy Beechel. And uh, it just got me started. You know, when I went back home, I wrote a, my first book was called Collecting and Care of Fine Art. Crown published it for me in New York in 1981. I had said to my brother one day, you know, we do all these collector seminars. I want to write a book. He said, do it. So I did. I mean, in the wee hours of the night on a, on a uh, Remington typewriter, we didn't have, you know, we didn't have computers then. Uh, and, and I put this together. Crown published it for me. It came out. It sold out. I didn't do it for any other avenue except to raise awareness That's and to help cool people. That's a cool story. It was neat. It was neat. And, um, do you still have the typewriter? I do, actually. It's in the basement of the gallery at home. We still have it. That's so cool. You, you should have had that on display. I, you show it to the kids. They look at it and say, what is that? Well, I mean, because <laughs> it's part of your history and everything. It's true. I should have. And that I wrote, would have been a cool <laughs> addition to the cipher. I wrote another book. After, yeah, go ahead. I'm sorry. No, no. No, I, go ahead. I don't want to interrupt you. Uh, I'm just thinking about the business of all How How does a gallery decide how to price all? Well, there are, there are markets within the markets. I mean, there are, there are auction records are one aspect of the market. The retail market is another market. The, the wholesale market, the dealer market is another market. So these things generally have a range where they fall into comfortably. There are always outliers and exceptions to the rule. You get something that's phenomenal. It's, it doesn't matter what was at auction. This thing, I mean, you can see it happening now with certain, certain things anyhow in the marketplace. But if you get some exceptional work of art that's unique, um, it's good and it's bad because you have nothing to compare it with that's that good, but at the same time you can you can you kind of name your price. But there there is a range within what most things fall. There's a high, there's a low, there's a middle ground, and um, it's based on the quality. It's based on the, the artist, the significance of the artist. It's based on so many factors. I mean, the economy, absolutely. I mean, there. That's one of the things I wrote about in collecting and care of fine art, the things that make pricing and, and the markets, how, how they're determined and why. 
um, because there's so many different the condition of a painting is another factor. If something's overstored, there's very little original left to it, it's not worth anywhere near what it would have been if it were entirely original. So you've got the size of the painting, the period of the painting that was that, when it was worked on. There's some things like the earlier things of Kelly, they're not inexpensive, but the later things are more expensive because they're they're more desirable. Yes. Do you happen to know if he left memoirs or journals? Uh, we did not see any. Okay. We're still hunting to find out. Yeah. I know we did a lot of drawings. We weren't privy to those either, mm -hmm. but we're trying to find out if they're available. If they are, we're going to buy them. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Because it makes sense to it correlate all those with, oh, the, with the work itself. Mm -hmm. Yes? Is there more of this type of portraiture? Yes. We, they're, they're wonderful. I know we have yeah. another handful of those. Not a whole lot. There may be six to ten of them in the whole. How many, how many paintings were in the estate? Uh, Couple hundred. Where was he living? He was originally in Philadelphia, and then he, toward the end of his life, he moved to Love Ladies, New Jersey, and that's where he stayed. He, he worked on the shore, um, and so some of the pictures later in his life are of Love Ladies, New Jersey, where there we have a couple of figures that look like they're almost bizarre, you know. But that was at the end of his life, and that's what he saw. So they were the bathers and love ladies. And some of them not bizarre. Some are really, they're like the, the surrealist things, and they're amazing, but they're very large, they're big pictures. So he was there, he spent time in Europe. He worked in Palencia, he worked in France, he lived in Paris, he was in Italy. Um, he was all over the place there, and he really was world renowned. So, um, yes? Uh, is he like also in that the woman he happened to be with at the time influenced his painting. Good point. Uh, when he was with Henriette in Paris, she was definitely an influence and, and the whole French influence. And later when he married Earl Porter's widow, Helen, she was really active in getting him back again onto the marketplace in the 40s with uh, Levy Gallery again and um, in New York, yes. And another gallery gave him a one-man show, and she got his things put into different places. So and they eventually got divorced, but um, she was a, a big factor in supporting his work. So that's you know that's that's important. I mean, because it could have gone the other way, where he became, he was very reclusive. Um, he was not somebody who was out in public a lot and, and wanted to be seen. He loved his work, and that, that was his passion. Anybody have any other questions? Uh, Yes. Any of his works in the Barnes collection? Yes, actually. That's another one. Uh, Barnes actually was, was one of his purchasers. Yeah. You know, I, don't, I haven't, I've seen the Barnes collection. They don't always have everything out all at one time because it's so massive. But uh, when they brought it from the suburbs of Philadelphia to Center City, they did recreate it just as it was in the suburbs, except for the, I think it's the Matisse triptych that's up top on the, uh, the balcony. Um, I wrote another book after collecting hair fine art, which kind of sold out. I wrote a book called Bader Field, How My Family Survived Suicide, because I lost a brother when I was 16, he was 22, and I kind of needed to memorialize my family. So it reads like a fiction novel, but it's not. It's a nonfiction uh, saga, and I'm trying to get it made into a film, because I think it'll, it'll, it'll save a lot of lives. Uh, I've been doing radio, television, and journal interviews, this is just a little background about me. Um, it's not really important, but I think it might make you more, uh, give you a better picture of who I am, why I do what I do. Um, so I've been doing radio, television, and journal interviews to raise awareness to suicide prevention and survival. So that's a, that's a real passion for me. Um, collecting and care of fine art came out again, a revised edition, I redid it with another publisher called Skyhorse Publishing in New York a couple summers ago. Upgraded a whole bunch of things, and now I realize I need to do it again because some of the markets have changed and everything. Is, you, you always think of things that you left out, but it happens. But uh, there's a lot of Oglethorpe in uh, the Bayer Field book. I mean, it's um, I spent two years here that were a huge part of my life, and my parents used to fly down to make sure I was doing what I was supposed to be doing. <laughs> <laughs> they would fly food down to me. I mean, it was great. Um, my father was a pilot as well as an art dealer, so we, they would hop in the plane and come down and um, make sure whoever I was going out with at the time was suitable. You know, was <laughs> but it was it was a great two years that I spent here. I mean, I, I really learned 
how to think, which is what college is supposed to teach you, not teach you what to think, but how to think. And I, I, I wait a couple of years here, and it was it was tough leaving. But I will be back well before the next 49 years, that's for sure. <laughs> so I don't know if anybody has any questions on here. Um, you know, we, we uh, made a statement the other night that if anybody winds up buying, making a purchase, that we'll either give a discount or we'll make a donation to the museum. We'll do something, you know, for the museum because it, it's important to us. It's our way of getting back and paying forward. And uh, I'd just like to thank everybody for coming out, and John, Barb, and uh, uh, where are you? Elizabeth, there you go. Uh, you know, for helping us to put this together because this is really very special. So thank you. Thank you. Thank you.